it's hot today. Today it's hot because it's a hot day and it's daytime. So we've got Buzz's, um, well, you can't see it yet, but we've got Buzz's Epiphone SG. Now it's a little bit light in the body. <clears throat> so the first thing I did was take off the uh, back cover and I mapped out the used up spare spaces. And then I made a lump of lead that fits that shape. And that's going to be our, um, yeah, our bit, <laughs> a bit of lead. So what I'm going to do is we're going to we're going to put this into the into the uh, cavity. But we may have to <coughs> excuse me move a couple of things around to get it to fit. But this is about as much extra ballast as we can fit in this um, space. So I did that off camera because it's just a, an easier bit of preparation to get done and out of the way. So what I'm going to do is just wrap it all up in some tape if I can. Um, so we just got a nice, that's not so clever. Let's go this way, see if that works just about. Um, yeah, so, so just adding as much extra lead as I can and as I say this is it <coughs> for the amount but it's better it's better than not adding anything so oh, we've got a big fly in here too so Buzz is um, brief on these both of these guitars the Yamaha uh, acoustic I did yesterday and this one is to get the action as light as possible so that he can play comfortably because he's got some issues with his hand strength which is something that happens to many of us in as we get older um, and so this you know it's very common for customers to come to me and say <coughs> can I um you know make this play especially light because the, their hands strength is reduced so I do my utmost to uh, do that damn flies yeah, drive me nuts okay so I'm just covering as, <coughs> as much of this as I can um, just to keep it from scratching anything um, lead isn't conductive <coughs> nor is it magnetic sorry lead is conductive it's not magnetic is what I meant but it's not very conductive in this form um, and it certainly not doesn't have any effect on magnets so some people have worried about that in previous videos where I've used lead um, and I have to reassure them that it's all good okay so that's I don't, I don't want to expand the size of this too much but I just want to hold it all together so I'll, I'll do this bit of lead a bit of lead a bit of tape all the way around the edge here just to keep it all in one chunk now it's a, it's a daytime shift so you can probably you'll hear people on the site doing their thing, <coughs> including some colourful language, but I try not to listen out too much for that. Right, there you go, there's my chunk of lead. It's not a huge amount, but it's the best I can do. It's the only option. Occasionally, when I've done this with extra ballast, um, <coughs> occasionally you have to move a component to one side, or it's typically the capacitors that get in the way, but this isn't such a situation so basically I'm going to fit that in there like this da -da -da -da. look at that in fact what I'm going to do is I'm going to fit it to the back of the case like that da -da. how about that perfectly fitting and actually we don't really need to do anything else everything is small and out of the way so we don't need any movement of components so what have we got here let's take a, a uh, usual sort of fly around well we've got um, we've got a, a nice upgrade here for this we've got some decent very nice quality Clouson machine heads and I've gone for as light as possible so we've gone for the slightly s less snotty green but still plastic um, tipped but you know we've got to keep the weight down that's half of the challenge here we've got the typical SG Epiphone plastic nut which we're going to take off and we're going to replace with uh, the custom adjustable and then we're going to put a roller bridge on down at this end um, and these guitars are, are pretty nice to play I've enjoyed these as this is a nice kind of uh, they've, they've 
they've done a nice thing here. They've put some sort of grain filler or stain on the top, um, and then they've kind of chamfered back or beveled back, and the wood underneath that hasn't got the stain on it, so you get a light edge. I don't, don't know how well you can see that. It's falling off the roof. Um, yeah, you can see it quite well there. So it's a nice touch. I like that. So at the moment, we've got a pretty high action, re relatively high action. And of course, um, what Buzz wants most of all is low and light. Now, at the moment, <coughs> this thing does say tens on here. Um, and I think I've got a set of tens or two kicking around. Um, so... Uh, and, and you might argue that if you really want it lighter, maybe nines would be the way to go. But we'll go for the low action. Now, the, the nut is actually set pretty well in terms of its height here. I um, haven't got any complaints about that, but it is sticky. So we'll, we'll get rid of it so that we benefit from the joys of the Tusk adjustable. Um, the adjustable is narrower than the Epiphone nut, so we're going to have to do a little bit of um, taking in. We've also got some goo on here from uh, hangers but we'll wash that off okay so the choice is what do we do first well I think with the strings attached I think we should do the standard things of uh, change the nut first so I'm going to put you into looking at the nut mode we will address address undress address the nut first <coughs> and we will then um, then we'll do the bridge action and we'll put on the new bridge um, and we'll go from there and do the leveling. So, uh, yeah, let's get on with it. So down we go with the strings. Now, I'm going to take the truss rod cover off because it's up against the nut, the plastic nut, so I don't want it, I don't want us to tap it and have it bashing against the plastic. There's no good reason. Everything else about this guitar is in really nice condition. I don't expect <laughs> famous last words from, the, from the, all these recent setups. I don't expect any unusual problems. And I need not to have any unusual problems today because I am here in the daytime because um, Claire's not too well. Um, nothing, nothing terribly bad, but she's, I think her hip is wearing out on top of all the other problems she's had. So. We're going, she's going down to the doctor this afternoon at 5.30, so um, I need to take her down. Um, okay, so let's have a look. So this, this is a, an example of a nut that sits in a slot, and it's, um, it's reasonably deeply positioned in that slot, okay? So, um, but it's not, it's not done in such a way that it's glued, uh, it's sprayed up to and, and into the nut. I think you can sort of see there's an air gap there, right? So they've been very precise with the cutting and fitting, but it's not stuck there like super glue. And that's that's a you know huge difference to the you know the um problems that we've been having with guitars where the nut is basically glued into place by the um by the finish that they put on it. Very thick glassy finish. And the the problem that we then get is that it <coughs> it breaks the finish when we tap the nut. So typically the nut will be glued in one or two places. Um, it'll either be glued along the bottom or glued against the face of the um, what do we call it <laughs> fingerboard. Now, from this time onwards, I'm going to tap this one because I want this to break the glue seal like that and fall out without anything bad happening, which is very kindly done. Um, and what I'm going to do uh, from now on is I'm going to scrape back. I can see there's been glue both on the wood and on the end of the neck. And actually, realistically, I don't think we need to be putting glue on the, the, the uh, you know, that thing, the wood, the bottom of the shelf, if you like. Because that, when you do that, that always runs to the risk of creating a, an uneven shelf, which this has done a little bit because it's taken off some sort of grains of... <laughs> <coughs> of the wood um, so we've got a slight bit of unevenness to contend with um, and actually this is much more much more denser much denser wood so we can afford to have glue up against this rosewood um, because it won't come off and it's it's end grain and it's not going to pull any shards off this is in the direction of the grain and it's going to pull fibers up easily 
So the first thing I'm going to do is get you back in frame, hopefully. First thing we'll do is we'll just line up our adjustable nut, first of all, and see how it feels. Now that's pretty much, feels like it's almost ready to drop in, but it has a little bit of extra width. So I'm going to take it down <coughs> carefully using my smaller of the um, sounding strips. But what I'll do is I always want to start off by ensuring that the front surface is nice and flat. Um, and it never, when we start off, when, <coughs> when we put the nut into the base, there's absolutely no reason why it will be you know, perfectly flush. Now, a bit of sanding makes it perfectly flush to begin with, and of course it also takes away a little bit of material. So we're a little bit closer to it fitting. Not far off, it's still a little bit tight. So now we'll go to the back, and we'll start taking some of the back down, and I'll kind of put a bit of extra pressure on the tusk end, because that sticks out to begin with a little bit wider so we'll wear that down a bit first and then we'll flatten it out and do the level the whole thing so now we've got we're thinning the nut and the insert or the base and the insert very slightly but we can afford to do that so there we are we're almost fitted in um, it's not quite sitting down at the base of the slot which we it is on that side but not on this side so we'll do a little bit more uh, sanding and we'll sort of make sure that we're taking it down on the base side a little bit heavier <coughs> so you know for, the, for some people these guitars are playable out of the box and um, just as they come and I have no <coughs> argument with that um, it, this bit of business of playability out of the box ability comes down entirely to your preferences um, and uh, you know f customers that come to me very often want lighter action than the uh, um, you know the guitar comes equipped with and that's fine um, you know truth is I would have probably enjoyed playing this at its default action when I first started playing but and I didn't I started with a horrible thing and it was hard work and so on but um, but these days, you know, as you get older and you want, you prefer different things, you, you know, um, a lot of customers do want that extra <coughs> uh, low action and, and are happy to pay for it. And some people get quite snotty about it, uh, talking as if, you know, if they, since they might find a, a guitar playable out of the box, so should everyone else. Okay, so... All the strings are on the first fret, which is exactly where I want them to begin with, because what I want to use is the upward lifting of the grub screws. But I'm not going to wind them in yet, because now I know it's um, how I want it and pretty much where I want it. I'm now going to do the thing which I promised I would do last time, is I will gently remove this. And we're going to use, this time we're going to use wood glue. And we're going to let it set in its own sweet time. And I can use wood glue because I know that the fit is snug enough. Uh, that once I've put the strings on, tightened them, they're not going to go, uh, the nut isn't going to go anywhere. So I just use a little bit of wood glue on the end. And um, But before I do that, what I'll do is I'll just remove the, I'll dial these in to remove the nut. Now if you do this at this point, a smart move would be to get a pencil and just mark which is the base side which is the treble side so that you uh, if you think about it we've sanded these two sides in unison so we want to put them back together in the correct way but i'm going to take them apart for a minute and i'm now going to just wind these grub screws until they're just slightly proud of the tusk and then i'm going to hold it as perpendicular as i can and rocking Fitfully from side to side, I'm going to aim to sand these down <coughs> and throw them on the floor and sand them down to a nice flat uh, thing bottom. Um, and the reason for that is uh, I just want them to spread the load of the strings a little wider so not they're not these are actually cup cup profile ends uh, in other words they were 
not quite pointy but not also not totally flat so by flattening them out we've just taken relieved a bit of the otherwise what would be pressure <coughs> um, on the uh, on the feet on the on the plastic of the 3d printed thing okay so there's my treble end back together and then we're going to put this in here now I'm just going to put some wood glue along the top here and hoping I've not really had much experience of whether this is enough but let's hope that this will be enough under load to hold everything where I want everything so we push it into the slot now there's a little bit of squeeze out there but that's fine so we get the line up here where we want it that's pretty good and then we'll let the strings do the downward loading so middle two in first I tell you what let's 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 do things in a sensible way let's wipe out this bit of glue this tiny bit of glue I'll scrape it out and then what I will do is I'll while the strings are off I will um, mark up the frets ready for leveling now I've played this guitar and it doesn't have major problems with the frets but oh no, what am I doing there are some very slightly uneven ones so we're the aim of this particularly um, for you know considering Buzz's hands or needs for this low action we're gonna we're gonna do all out to get this to a really low SG action Now the good thing about SG's um, is that I found in over time is because the bulk of the uh, neck lives outside of the mass of the body um, it means that we can get very low action um, and with leveling really low action so it's not at all unheard of to have a one millimeter last fret low E action from an SG and it's you know in that sense it's a brilliant design because unlike the Les Paul where the, um, the neck goes a long way into the uh, con you know, sort of weighty body and <coughs> um, it gets held in a sort of stiffened grasp. Um, the SG you know, all stands outside of it which means the whole of the bending truss rod area lives outside of the, um, the mass of the body as well. So it means that the, the curvature <coughs> that you dial in on your truss rod is also uh, a lot more uh, progressive across the whole of the neck which is good as well so for those reasons I find the SG tends to set up pretty well and with a low action so as I said what we'll see straight away is these are either on or just very slightly above the first fret <coughs> which is exactly how we want it because now we're going to use these little grub screws to just dial up the action to where we want it on both sides and we'll find the, the, the SG. The Epiphone is quite tall, a nut arrangement. So we have to go up a reasonable amount. But I, I put in the taller of the bases that Gerard made for me. He gave me three different sizes, which was brilliant. So you can see straight away that um, we've got the frets ready for leveling. We've got the weight ready for fitting later on, the bridge ready to refit um, a bit later on, and the tuners ready to put on later on. And of course, we don't need to do them now because they're not going to make any difference to the fret leveling part of the process. Now, what I'm going to want to do at this point before I start leveling, now we've got the nut where we want it. Um, now I'm going to make adjustments to the bridge, this current bridge, even though it's not going to be the bridge that stays on, doesn't really matter. I'm just going to use it to, ooh, long shot. Just going to use it to um, set the action that I want for the fret leveling process. So if I just take a, a quick look at it here, we've got, um, we've got. 2.25, 2.3 mils. 
So I'm going to start by taking this down, so dialing it in. Down, I'm going to go down to about 1.2, which is crazy, but that's what I'm going to aim for. 1.2, and I'm going to go about the same on this side. And then we'll just double check the neck relief, make sure we've got some. Um, because it's not going to play if we don't. We have a very small amount. So it should play okay at this point in time. Although I expect we'll have some chokes, but won't worry about those for now. So what I'm doing is I'm just going to get this stretched so that we can tune it up to pitch. It's not critical that it's exact, just to load the neck <coughs> realistically. No, no pings from the nut. Mm hmm. Lovely. Okay, so. It's going nice and smoothly. I have no complaints. You, you can see how simply and beautifully that printed nut base and the insert and this Epiphone nut shelf work together. And I have to say that that is a joy of working on Epiphones because they have they don't glue up the the nut as um, you know Harley Bentons do. I'm afraid. Sorry, Harley Benton. I'm, I'm looking out for you because. You've got me worried now. So they don't gum them up. They don't risk breaking all the finish off like the Harley Bentons and the Vintage not long ago did. Get away, fly. And um, they, uh, they, the nut comes off beautifully simply. And it just so happens that the nut slot is of the depth that's perfect for the combination of base and adjustable nut together. So here comes the bit where we're going to tune the rod to the exact curve of the neck. Now, I've said this a few times before, um, but the beauty of this method is twofold. There's, there's actually lots of little wonders about why this is such an elegant method. Um, and in fact, like I was, well, it's, yeah, it's just very elegant. And the reason it's elegant um, is, now I'm just looking, this may be struggling to reach flat because this neck is almost perfectly flat. So I'm going to have to put this totally to slack, and if it doesn't, if it doesn't do it, <coughs> then we're as flat as we can go, basically, which is just on the mark there. Um, yeah. So the the reason why this is an elegant method is, first of all, um, I'm going to just put a little thing tabs on here. Uh, first of all, it it it's the only method. I don't mean my method. It's not my method. Uh, but doing leveling with the strings on is the only way you can level, first of all, with longitudinal compression at play. Um, any other method where you take the strings off, you reintroduce the compression later. So you level the neck with... Oh, this fly is doing my head in. I'm going to have to take a shot at it at some point with a, a rag. And I'm not, a, I'm not an animal killer, really, so you make your way out, please, before it gets... <laughs> Did you hear me? Um, yeah, anyway, so norm, normal levelling methods, you have to take the strings off. You level it with the strings off, um, which means the neck is not loaded, um, and then you, um, you put the strings back on, and the neck becomes loaded, and it changes shape. Um, and it can change the shape because the longitudinal compression makes it do different things. So... Um, and there are people, some of the luthier companies like Stumac and places like that, um, and, and others, make uh, jigs for uh, duplicating or simulating the curvature of the neck under playing conditions. But actually all it's doing is bending the neck. The, what's not doing is compressing it this way, which is what these strings are doing. If you think about it, they're pulling this, this neck into the body and into itself. So... Uh, this is the only method where you're leveling with the longitudinal compression in play as you level. Um, and because of that, it's, it's actually going to be the same when you put the strings back on. You'll, it'll be exactly as you leveled it. 
no, the, no other methods really do that. Okay, now what we'll carry on now is across the string uh, tracks and then we'll get to, once we've done the G track, we'll test the big bends across on the E across to the G, um, G track if you like. And that's when we'll detect whether we, we can get the full bends out of our strings without there being any choking. Um, so, so yeah, this, this levels um, with longitudinal compression at play. It's the only way that does. Um, so it's a, a little bit more accurate than other methods. Um, the other thing then that, that it improves on is it's the only method, because it's got the strings on, it's the only method you can stop leveling as soon as you've got the, the strings or the action you've set playing correctly. So you notice that I set the action um, and then we make the frets comply, if you like. Brilliant, this is ultra low. Now we're gonna recalibrate for the G track. Um, yeah, so it's the only one that has strings on and the, the beauty of that is that I can stop as soon as I've leveled enough to clear up the action that I've got dialed in, because I don't want any lower than that. 1.2 millimeters on the low E is plenty low enough for any guitar. Um, so I only level uh, up to the action that I've set, which means I don't take off any more fret metal than is absolutely necessary. Um, and the other methods do. They, they sort of, I suppose you could say, they, they level to an arbitrary, um, perfect levelness. You know, with your fret rocker, you're aiming for complete levelness between, um, between frets uh, re relative to each other. Well, you don't need absolute mathematical levelness. You only need as, as much leveling as is required to make the action you've chosen play properly. And that way we preserve fret metal. Brilliant. I mean, it's an unbelievably low action. We can get across. Perfect. It's going to be great. Um, yeah, so we, we now we can move on because I've got all of those notes playing at this ridiculously low action that I've set. Um, and we don't need to keep on leveling until... You know, if we, if we did a thing, if we flattened it out and did a rocker, you'd probably hear clicks still because that the, the rocker is showing this sort of absolute um, or it's trying to tell you it's telling you how to get it absolutely level and you could carry on taking fret metal off but there's no point that's the whole point I'm making so we level to the action that we've chosen and thereby save on metal um, so that that's a couple of the major reasons um, now the other re reason uh, is very subtle, but it's very important, and that is uh, leveling with um, a, a beam and a fret rocker, the old-fashioned system with the strings off. That's focused entirely and can only work on high frets and, to some degree, low frets. Now, the truth about frets is that it's your low frets that dictate how your guitar plays, because a low fret makes the next fret effectively high. So a little bit of zizzle going on in there. I mean, it is incredibly low. We're okay on there. We are crazy low, but I'll do a little bit more. Yeah, so, um, so the point being is the low frets make the next fret high. So what happens is you typically will come across uh, a pile of, a little cluster of low frets usually, one or two. Um, and the reality is, the only way you're going to get rid of the problems caused by those frets, low, low frets, is to gently level everything else down around them and bottom them out, basically. Now, it's only a, it's, it's only tiny um, amounts, so we're not talking about huge, you know, stripping the frets right off the board. Um, but you have to, you've got no choice, you have to go down. If you want to get rid of that relative unlevelness, you have to 
um, bring everything down and bottom out those frets. Um, now, that's cool. So that's one thing that a, a beam can do. That's one thing this does. Um, but one thing that this does, the added really main added bonus for me. Now I need to tighten this a little bit. We've got a bit of a curvature now. Um, the one thing that this method does that no other method does, as far as I'm concerned, and that's a secondary thing. So we know that most beams are good for leveling high frets or bottoming out to level out the average out the low frets. But this goes one step further. This takes care of what I call fret slap. Fret slap is where, um, typically, is where you've got level, relatively level frets enough so they don't stand out as uneven frets or you don't get fret choke. But the overall shape of your fingerboard under compression is just a little bit like this. And so your frets are still relatively a little bit odd, um, you know, uneven. And as a result of that, what you get is the moving strings just sort of clip occasionally the tops of the frets. Now this tool, because it, it keeps its shape, it means that you can, when you dial in the sort of approximate curve as taken from the three points on here, you're dialing in an ideal curve that you're going to gently impose on a less than ideal curve. And that little bit of extra cutting of the perfect curve onto the peaks of the uneven curve just clears up, usually clears up the fret slap. I'm hearing a little bit down there. Now we are very, very flat. I mean, there's a little bit of relief and I'm going to stick with it just to be challenging. So I'm going to try and now use this tool to um, just scoop out the fret slap down at this end in the method I've, or in the, in the way I've just described. So what I want is I want this thing to have the right curve. There it is. It's, a, it's the tiniest curve. It's hardly recognizable. And I'm going to now um, try. I'm going to focus on this end and I'm going to sort of let gravity do most of the work down here. But I'm definitely focused a little bit more now on this end where I was hearing some fret slap. So I want this tool to gently scoop out the frets to represent as close as possible the curve in this beam. Um, and it's just a little bit of extra attention with very little downward force. It's mostly just the weight of the bar. Now, I'm not sure if it's going to show up on this one, but what you can hear normally when I do that is that this just eases off that little bit of buzz. Better than it was. I'm going to do it one more time on the whole lot. Um, and it's not taking much in the way of metal, but it's... And, and actually, funny enough, the more I do it, the closer I get to where I want to be, the more I just sort of take off the downward pressure and concentrate on letting the shape of this beam do its work. Um, so I'm, I'm putting a kind of... I, a touch, the touch gets lighter as... Um, I get closer to where I want to be. And the question as to when to stop is one of testing, listening and feel. Yeah, that will do me. Okay, one calibration now for the low E. And we'll do the same tension on the low E. Once we've done that, it's a matter of re-crowning the frets, which have gained a little bit of, um, you know, been lowered a little bit and flattened a little bit. Um, there we go, that's good. Tuned perfectly. Um, yeah, we'll, we'll re-crown the frets and then it'll be a case of um, masking off the fretboard and polishing them all out or sanding them first and then polishing them out. And once that's done, we'll be ready to change the tuners, put the new bridge on, install the lead, check everything, clean everything. And hopefully we'll be done and dusted. Um, and I have to say, it, it will be, I'm, t I'm tempting fate, 
but it would be nice for once or for a first time in a while to have a straightforward, well behaved uh, guitar in the setup. But you know, that's one thing that. Oh, my wrist is hurting still. It's one thing that um, Epiphones are quite good for, and that is they behave. So a tiny amount of fret slap on these strings, but the clearance is so tiny, it's hardly surprising. I'll do a little tiny bit more, um, but I'm, th there is a limit beyond which you can't go, and you, it doesn't make, it doesn't pay to go. Um, it, you know, it becomes it, eventually once you're at a certain level uh, in terms of um, action height. It becomes a, a, a bit of a rule of diminishing returns, so um, we'll, we'll give it its best shot and then we'll back off. And if needs be, we'll put the tiniest raise at this end because we've got plenty to play with given I started out with such a low target. Um, you know, 1.5 millimeters and 1.2 would feel very low, and as you know, I've gone for 1.2 and about 1.1. which is pushing it. That's a string cut off, scraping against a string. Mm. Right, that's at its absolute lowest, but it's playable and it feels great. So I'm going to I'm going to go with that. Um, if by the end of it I think there's any need for it, we'll tweak it up the tiniest fraction. But I don't think there will be. I think we're right on the spot on the, the right on the sweet spot there. So I'm going to take off the protective gorilla tape here. Throw it away. Oh my wrist. <laughs> Okay, um, we'll get these strings off. Now, when you're working with an adjustable nut, my recommendation is you take the outside strings off first, leave the middle two on, uh, and that will pr prevent the pressure throwing the nut off sideways. And the same with uh, opposite, do the opposite when fitting it. So put the middle ones on first, kind of lock it in place, and then take the um, do the outside ones, but we're doing it in the reverse. There we go. Okay. Now, um, what might be good while we're right here is to get this bridge off now, before I take the strings off completely. Let's swap over the bridge and just compare for um, height, because I'm pretty certain this is a, almost the same size, but it could be about a millimeter taller. So we just got to make sure that we have the scope and we don't need to do any filing of bridges, which we could well do with that. So, whoops. So on you go. Now, well, that's a good one. Fractionally, well, barely fits on. Okay, that's a little bit tight, but it's not the end of the world. If, if it was any type, if it were was any tighter, what I would have done would have probably drilled out the hole just slightly on the on the bridge but it's it's actually sitting there quite well so I'm just gonna put the strings back on and we'll check and make sure that we've got the downward adjustment that we need to get it back down to that nice low action that we had and if that's the case then it doesn't really matter that the that there's any difference between the bridge height as long as we've got the adjustment room to soak up that difference, I suppose, is what I'm saying. So the roller bridge, um, my preference for the roller bridge is that it gives you a little bit, primarily gives you more intonation travel. Um, the, the reality is, my, in my experience anyway, and that's not, <clears throat> I'm not a 
not that's not so much a load of gigging or playing experience it's more setup stuff but um, in both playing and setting up I haven't really found that um, tunematic bridges break strings down here it's, it's much more the tuner end or the ball coming off on the stop bar but um, so having having a roller is kind of notionally a bit gentler Um, it's a bit gentler, but it's also a tiny bit gentler on the string as well, in case there is any stress on it. Oh yeah. Um, now let's just check the settings. So there's a bit of room there for up and down. We are a bit taller now, so we can now go down again on this. Um, yeah, so the other thing about the, the roller that you kind of might hear arguments saying, well, this is a good reason. The roller bridge, you know, you can drag the string across the roller when you're doing bends or something. Um, and to be fair, it's not really moving at all at that end. If it's, it's much of a bigger problem at this end because it gets stuck in the, in the channel that we call the string slot. Um, the nut slot, but at this end, the, the movement across a, a pointy saddle or a roller is m m hardly any different. Um, it does matter if you're running a tremolo of some sort because then you are dragging the string. But um, so my principal reason for recommending this upgrade is for the um, the uh, actually they're the better built. Um, the, and there's more international route travel, which is a bane of my life on the tunematic bridges. Okay, so we're happy so now we've got our frets leveled we've got a new bridge on we've got enough adjustment room to get it where we want actions good relief is really nice and flat we'll leave it there because it's playing well keep our spare parts over there next is the crowning um, and polishing out I'll, we'll cover the crowning part but I will go off camera for the sanding and polishing part as I usually do because it's boring and mind-numbing and noisy um, and it's not even rocket science, but um, so after that, what I'll, I'll probably do any second now, when we've got the strings off, um, probably put the, I'll show you uh, getting the, what's that stuff, you know, uh, lead in place, we'll, we'll tap that in. So I'm just going to cut these now, got a few sets of sacrificial strings, so we don't need to keep those for that purpose. Okay, off you come, and then I've got to undo these little double backs. And while we're at it, I suppose I could, I could change the strings, springs, no. Well, I won't, I won't change the tuners now, because one of the reasons why is once I've done all the uh, sanding business, um, then I can take the tuners off then. I can take them off now actually, but I won't put the other ones on. So th this is what, see that's broken off now. That bugs me, this locking thing. Buzz, you're never going to do it again, are you? Promise me. Because now I have to get a, a digger out. And as soon as I get a digger out, we are now in danger of hitting the finish. It's just not a good system. And I, honestly, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm putting something, bending something some way or other, you know. I, I can't do it with my finger, it'll make me bleed copiously. So now I'm, I'm trying to find a way of pulling this string over that one so I can get the two untangled. And as you can see, it's, it's just not easy. What am I going to do? Something, it's like a, I need a, what's that thing that you protect your thumbs with when you're sewing? <laughs> Uh, that thing, you know what I mean. Oh my god. It's got the most obvious name. See, this is old age now. 
Uh, you know the thing I'm talking about. Young youngsters amongst you won't have a clue what I'm talking about, but it's a thing. <laughs> yeah. Oh boy, it's not something I even think about more than once every hundred years, but. Uh, thanks. Right. See, that's why I don't like that wrapping round business. Okay. Uh, <laughs> thumb something. Well, it's got to be a thumb. Th th thimble. Gee whiz. Thumb thimble. Thimble. I mean, who would have called it thimble? Sort of, sort of like a thumb, but only with an i. Anyway, sorry, I'm just tying up these strings. Yeah, thimble. That's what I needed for getting those undone, which is unfair. I shouldn't have to run that risk. Okay. So, just ready. Oh, okay, that's the other thing. So we're going to do some polishing and stuff. So while we're doing that, we can d dial in the grub screws and we can take out the that. Because we, we know this bit isn't totally solidly fitted, so we don't want anything hitting it. We can cover it over in tape next and it will carry on drying at its leisure. So it's a good idea to take that off. And a way of taking it off without risking pulling up the rest of the thing is to dial in the screws and push it out on its own legs. My wrist joint is hurting me. Okay, so now I'm repainting the frets prior to using the uh, concave fret crowning file, um, which will basically um, gently scrape off or file off the flat, I call it the shoulders, I suppose, of the flat spots that we've just created. Um, and it will allow me to um, sort of gently round them over into a, this arch shape that we really ideally want, that they should be, or they are in their new state. So they're not major mega jumbo frets. So I'm going to use the medium size side um, and I can see uh, you know the, the flatter spots. Now sometimes um, when you do this the flat spots <coughs> show you where you've done leveling but quite often they show you where um, I'll put them on here. They show you where uh, someone else in the history of the guitar may have leveled to. Now I don't know that the case is with Buzz's guitars but <coughs> quite often I get guitars from people who just bought them perhaps recently on eBay and then when I do this, I know how little or much leveling I've done, but often I can I can start the leveling process and suddenly find great big flat spots and they show up at this point here. And uh, you know, I know for a fact that I haven't done that much leveling, which then gives me a pretty clear in indicator of how much was done previously. And then the only kind of question that comes out of that is where was it done? Was it factory based? Was it a previous owner? Um, and sometimes you can you can sort of deduce um, which is the correct answer, but sometimes you never know really. And sometimes you do that, you run off the end. So I'm aiming to file these back so that the um, black pen gets scraped off and just leaves a thin line down the top. When I leave that thin line down the top, it tells me that I've rounded off the frets without lowering them any more than they were. And that's just a really neat indicator to tell me that I haven't messed up the relative levelness of them, uh, of the frets that we, you know, we've worked hard just, just a minute ago to get. So that's the, the value of the marker pen at this stage in the game. Now when you come across a fret that is, has been relatively flattened um, because of either before or because of what you had to do to uh, level it out then it, it takes it a little bit longer and sometimes you can't really get too much past a certain thinness of black line down the middle and you have to kind of stop at that point and work with what you've got and it'll still play fine it just may not be quite as arch shaped as I would have liked it. Now I, I think this um, the frets are, are reasonably low on this so it feels like it's either been played quite thoroughly. The, the frets showed some signs of leveling before and um, 
if it's not something that Buzz has done and he's had it from you, I can't remember now what he said, but um, if it's not something he's done and he's had it from you, then it could well be sign, a sign of the manufacturer leveling in the factory. And actually, as I've said many times before, I'm seeing more and more evidence of this. I think because for the very small investment in time uh, required to do a radius block, quick radius block level on a flattened neck, um, I think the the amount of action playability options that gives to a buyer straight out of the box is much greater than the downside um, of the fact that the they when they do it like that they don't crown re, often don't recrown or polish the frets and sand them and polish them out in the sort of progressive way that I'm going to do now um, and the, while that's a bit of a downer. Um, it takes time and, and therefore money to do it to that degree of polish. So I think pound for pound, it's still a good decision they make to do a quick level because, as I say, that, that gives them a much better, much greater playability. And I think people genuinely are willing to put up with, um, you know, they, they often don't notice and often overlook the... Uh, you know, the fact that it's not been crowned. It's usually someone like me who can look at it and say, oh, these have been leveled but not recrowned. Um, but to, to many players, that really isn't something you would notice or pick up on. Um, and so, you you know, your experience of it would be just that you can take it out of the box and dial in a fairly low action and away you go. And that's, that's from a, you know, it's a win-win. Um, you know, if, if it's not that important that you can... You can't tell that it hasn't been recrowned, um, and you can set a, an action that makes you feel cool straight out of the box. Then it's a good move on the part of the manufacturers. But as you can see, that it, it, it to do it this way, to get it precision level, and then to um, polish out all of the uh, you know, fully polish out all of the frets to a shine takes time. Um, and therefore money in the factory context. So we are, I'm just doing this bit now to get all the, most of the marker pen and dust off the fingerboard. We'll give it another clean afterwards. Um, I can stay where it is. So now um, let's just, oh yeah, we're going to do the uh, electronic bit. Ooh. Um, I'll bring you down here so you can see a bit up close what's going on. I'll point you, I'll look through the window, look through the square window. So we have a chunk of this carefully cut to go round that little switchy thing there um, and it will sit on top of everything and press down quite neatly. The only thing that might stop it is the fact that there's a little edge at the moment on this tape. So I'm going to get a fresh blade, a fresh blade of Bel Air and I'm going to trim it back and then I'm going to put some double-sided sticky tape on it and I'm going to, um, I'm going to lift, stick it, press the thing, the plate on it and it'll stick it to the plate and we'll know where it, it will go where it should be. So just um, slightly off camera, I'm going to try and trim this back just to, just to stop it from getting in the way and preventing us from pressing this flat against the cavity cover. Okay, <laughs> come along. So, what is it? It's Friday today. Friday. Ooh, so-called weekend. It's funny, when you get to a certain age or you, you're working for yourself or this doing this kind of thing, weekends really don't mean anything anymore. Um, especially if you're not a kind of go out with the lads type of um, person. Have I just done? Yeah, no, it's this side. That's right. Yeah, so not being a great social light. Um, weekends not really any different from anything else. Um, particularly because I work up here on the weekends. I suppose working on the weekends, for me, 
means I don't have to stress throughout the week to rush to get things finished. Um, oh, you know, I don't have to kind of break break a neck, break my neck to do it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to I'm going to put this, I'm going to try and uh, try and cut this, trim this a little bit to shape, and then with my sharper blade. And once I've done that, um, I'm going to peel it off, and then we're going to place the thing the weight in the cavity and then we're going to lower the lid on it and that should then stick to it. Um, I've tried it before with Velcro and it's actually a bit bulky Velcro. It does a pretty good job but you just really need, this This will stay in place just by the fact that I've cut it in a shape that will, it, it'll sit in there like a jigsaw pa puzzle. puzzle. The only reason I'm thinking of the tape, the sticky tape, is just to perhaps stop it if it has any temptation to move anywhere but it's, it's you can see it's it's tailored to fit right in that space so it's it's almost certainly not going to go anywhere so it's a very bespoke little little thing everybody's electrics are different this one's obviously got two the two push push pots um, which take up quite a bit of room as well so it's different if it's just four regular pots okay so I'm now going to press that in there like that and with a of luck we shall just whoops replace the cover and screw it down so I'm going to sort of press down from this end and that end there we have it down now I'm not even going to lift it off but if we did lift it off I will bet that that would come away with it, and if it didn't, that's fine too. Um, should we just should we just see if I'm making it up? Da, 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 da. There we have it. That's our. I should take a picture. No, you've got a picture there. You can see it. That's our fantastic, fantastic cover. Let's put you down there. Now we'll show the fitment of my custom-built sticky thing. There we are on top of there. Slot into place, will you? Thank you. Do up, will you? Thank you. That's that bit done. I must admit, the, the cutting of the lead took about half an hour off camera, so it's not a it's not a quick thing to do, and you know you've got to map it out and check that it'll fit and whatnot. But it's a rewarding thing to do because you get just a little bit of extra. Of course, I will check, by the way, that everything plays, because while this is not conductive. Um, it's sitting in there pressing down with this lid so it, you know if there's a weak solder joint or something and it's pressing on it it could be that it causes it to break um, and then we'd have no sound but you know if we had no sound all of a sudden I'd know what the cause was and we could go to it okay so ooh, a tiny bit heavier body nothing rattling that's so cool um, we'll come back to our new cluesons after the sand out and clean up so i'm gonna go off cam do the uh taping everything off now um to protect it and then come back when that's done all right so i'm going to stop this i'm going to put these on charge as well because i didn't charge them last night so i'll see you in a minute okay right New tuners fitted. Mm -mm -mm. Cluesongs. Perfect match. I mean, perfect drop in. So that's absolutely brilliant. Um, now it's time to restring. I've done all of the polishing out, cleaned everything, refitted everything. So it is time to restring. And actually, I'm happy with the amount of relief in the truss rod. So I am also going to um, replace that. So we're kind of all good to go. Uh, just restring, stretch the strings out, and check the intonation, and we should be out of here. As in, heading back to take, get ready to take the missus to the doctors. So we're on time. That should be good. Okay, so here comes the. Sun, dude, and dude. No, here comes the 
Oh, you can't probably can't even say that now. You know, they um, had a bizarre experience the other night when I played a couple of songs and the Google algorithm uh, found out what they <laughs> were, decided it recognized them. But the funny part was I played, um, oh blimey, what did I play? A Day in the Life by the, well, I thought by the Beatles. And, um, but this is the interesting bit. <laughs> Not that I played it or how well I did or didn't play it. The interesting part is that as I was playing it or before I played it, I said, um, I said, I'm going to play something or probably get done for copyright. And uh, I said, this is, this is a day in the life by the Bartles or something like that. I kind of faffed around with the pronunciation. Um, and then, when uh, I published the video a bit later on, YouTube sent me a thing saying, copyright infringement identified, like I expected. And it, it did a couple of things. First one, it said, um, day in the life, live from Drammen in Norway, right? I'm thinking, right, okay, do I recall the Beatles ever playing in Norway or, you know, I thought, well, okay, so I've, I've the the algorithm thinks I've copied a live a live rendition of a day in the life from Drammen from, and so I'm thinking, well, I don't remember that was you know maybe that was a where Beatles played and maybe that's the technicality behind the uh, but that thing um, copyright anyway. So I went and looked a little closer at it and. It said, no, no, the copyright owner, oh, sorry, no, it didn't say that. It said, the song you have copied, in, in no uncertain terms, the song you have copied is A Day in the Life, played live in Drammen by a Norwegian group called Det, Det ba, be, Betals, Det Betals or something, right? Me, you know, Norwegian version of the Beatles or something. And it's a cover, well, I don't know, tribute band, cover band, anyway, whatever. Uh, but apparently the long list of copyright owners relating to that band and that song included somewhere in it, was it Northern Music or something like that? Anyway, so go, okay, maybe that's, you know, maybe they own, huh, maybe they own both this band and the copyright, and maybe they think I've, I've copied this band or whatever. Um, and actually, it didn't sound any different from the Beatles version of it. But the algorithm decided that because I said the the Beatles, it decided to identify in my speech the band it thought I had copied. Isn't that incredible? Or well, the song by which band it thought I had copied. Just amazing. So anyway, that, I thought that was just amusing to be told I had I had copied a band I'd never heard of. There you are. That's the first thrill. Okay, so I'm going to restring with the middle two in first on these new 19 to 1 ratio tuners mm -hmm, nice and smooth this is going to transform the feel of tuning although it won't ch change the tuning stability because the tuning stability is a com combination of the quality of your nut slots and the amount of unreleased slack in your strings and it's those two things pretty much only now people find that hard to believe because they're absolutely determined to believe that the tuners either do or don't keep the guitar in tune, and they don't. Um, which is, which as I say, is difficult for people to get their heads around. Um, but it doesn't. Um, I can make this guitar, if it had the crappiest tuners in the world on it, I could make it stay in tune by getting the nut slots right, i.e. fitting, in this case, an adjustable tusk nut with the nut, uh, you know, with the slots cut right and so on. I could get that right and you could have a, a set of Chinese pressed metal tuners in there and it would still um, still work absolutely fine. Stay in tune perfectly. I could put you these Cluson 19 to 1 tuners, which are more expensive. Um, and if you don't get the nut right and you don't get the slack taken out the strings before you start playing, I guarantee you these expensive tuners won't keep it in tune. So all these do is give you a more precise and reassuring experience of tuning, which is 
more than good enough reason to spend the money on them. I don't knock it at all. Um, and they look great and they feel nice to operate, right? Absolutely worth every penny. But don't make the mistake of thinking that they will keep your guitar in tune because they will not. And that's a major misconception that is propagated throughout the forums and the corridors of the know-it-alls, you know. And I you have to keep in mind that when I claim something or state something that I have observed, it's over probably a couple of thousand setups in the last six or seven years. It's a lot. I'm talking from experience, not from, um, you know, having read loads of stuff and talked to loads of people who do this stuff. It's from having done it all that time um, and having proven it each time I have an idea about it or I think, hey, well, this, that's, that's, that's not, you know, I come up with the idea, go, hey, hang on, it's got nothing to do with the tuner. I will test it every single time after that because I like to test ideas and make sure that they're, um, that they're if I'm making a claim, that it's substantiated by evidence. I'm a bit nerdy like that, or actually I'm a bit scientific, if you like, in that respect. So, trust me, if I say something, it's because one and a half to two thousand setups have shown me it to be the case, not because I read it in several Strat Talk forums or Les Paul Owners Cork Sniffing Club or whatever, you know. It's like the, you know, I keep saying about the packaging thing, you know, every now and then I'll, somebody will inevitably post on a Facebook group or a, some forum, they'll go, what's the best courier to use? And then everybody will dive in um, and you'll have, everybody will immediately state that Parcel Force or, that's, yeah, Parcel Force, for example, terrible. They, they smashed the first guitar I ever tried sending with them. They're awful, never use them again. And... I just enjoy um, jumping up and saying, what have I done with my cu cutters, by the way? I enjoy popping up and saying, um, well, how come is it then that I've sent probably, oh, God knows, maybe, maybe a thousand courier uh, guitars by a courier, and I've received half that many again, possibly three quarters of that many again from customers who follow my s packaging system and let's say take it as individual courier sends right let's call it um, let's call it thousand and a half courier sends easily not one single breakage not one single loss in all of those numbers and you're complaining because the first one you sent got broken now who's probably more likely to be at fault just statistically one and a half thousand times no damage nothing and you put your guitar in a package and it gets broken i think you're probably i put my money on it being your packaging that was crap not not the courier of course people absolutely cannot stand to be told that um so it drives them nuts and then they argue from now until the cows come home until they're blue in the faces and so on because they will not accept that that could be their responsibility but you know what it always is and, th and they they're so attached the thing that really cracks me up is they're, they're so utterly attached to their version of it which is my first guitar I ever sent got smashed parcel force of rubbish their cowboys I'll never use them again they're so attached to that and having no responsibility for it themselves not even perish the idea they literally cannot see or read the evidence you put in front of them. And you go, did, did the numbers I just told you, did, did, that not, did that not go anywhere? You know, did, you, did it sink in? Did you, did you read it? Um, do, do you think I'm making it up? Or what do you do with that piece of evidence? And they just can't answer. They don't answer. Because it's, and it's one of those things that really it kind of depresses me. When it's, it's, when you see, it's like when you see dogma come up against evidence and proof. You know, scientific, evidence-backed proofs, if you like, and you know how people just cannot let go of their beliefs.
And it's it's in that sort of moment when you when you watch somebody refusing to process the f the factual information you've given them because it clashes with what they want to believe. That is that is unbelievably low. That is incredible action. If I had come anywhere near a guitar with such an action in my school days, I would have killed the owner, buried their body in the woods just to get hold of that guitar. That would have been that would have been the holy grail of any guitars ever. I'm just sticking the hex key on there. So I'm going to do a little bit of stretching to get this thing ready to go and then we'll do the intonation test. So everything is dialed back up to where I had it. So while I took the strings off and the bridge off and everything, everything changed around the bridge up and down. Um, but because we leveled it at that low action, as soon as I put the strings back under load, I can set everything back to the same action and I know it's going to play. It's just going to drop right back into where it was happily playing. So that's the beauty of it. Right, one more stretch. Actually, I'll do some stretches this way. And then, so the secret of this is the more you want this to stay in tune, the more you stretch these strings out before you start playing. And people often say, but, you know, doesn't it? I've actually had people say, oh, I tune it up a semitone or a tone overnight and leave it settle, and then by the time the morning comes around, it's good. It's like, no, it's not. You will, you will have slack in those strings, I promise you, that will be coming out for years to come because it will, it will leach its way out over time. Every time you hit a tremolo, it'll, a bit more will come out. Or every time you bend a string or every time you tune it up, um, you know, it, a little bit of the, that slack will let itself out and you will go out of tune. Um, the only way to stop that is to get the nut slots right and to get that guitar strings stretched out to begin with. Basically you want to keep stretching so it doesn't detune anymore. That is an, a blindingly low action. So, you know, not just for the sake of setting a low action, it's not a game to sort of see who can do the best. Um, because you can become a victim of the low action in that, um, you know, if you're not careful and you set it too low, or you set it this low, you're also susceptible to climate change things, weather change. Um, and all it takes is, a, I don't know, you switch your central heating on a day early, and then your neck will change shape slightly. And uh, because we're dealing with such tiny clearances, um, the, it's, it's highly likely that um, you know, the tiniest change will mean that, that uh, the guitar that didn't buzz you know, previously will suddenly start buzzing. That's just the downside of liking low actions it's just the way it is. Um, there's nothing, you know, there's no point worrying about it. It's, it's how it works. Um, the lower you like them, the more susceptible they are to um, weather change and so on. Now this is very stiff and it doesn't really want to go anywhere. Um, and it doesn't really like the screwdriver coming in at any kind of angle. So I'm just going to lower this. Whoops, that's dropped out. That's going to be a pain in the backside, I think. Well, let's make the adjustment first. See, it's very difficult to get a grip on these screws. So that was 
running a little bit flat, so I'm dragging these saddles a little bit forward um, to shorten the length, playing length, so the the intonate, the 12th fret, fret, the fretted 12th fret note isn't flat, which it currently was. <sighs> Blimey! So the people who've positioned this in the factory have just staggered it a little bit, a um, little bit long. Now, just got to try and get this back up. If it's dropped off there, no, that's okay, good. I thought we might have run off the end of the screw, which would have been annoying. Okay, so three millimeters as a sort of guide figure, and it is entirely subjective and personal, so I can't advise anybody. All I will say is that the closer the pickups are to the strings the more the out the greater the output but apparently the less the tonal dynamics or the less rich tonal dynamics um, so if you want to I recommend you experiment Fab. I'm just going to do literally one quick check with the little amp. I'm not going to play it out loud. I'm just going to put it through here. just want to make sure that the circuits are all working without... with the um, lead in the cavities. Fabulous. Job done. Right. I'm going to stop there. I'm going to zip home and take care of the, the good lady. Beautiful. Fair number of spare parts to send back with this as well. But it's, I mean, this is, this is about, well, it's not about, this is as low as any action that Buzz is ever going to get. And uh, I know he's going to really appreciate how light that is to play. Not everybody's cup of tea, but for someone in Buzz's situation, perfect low action. So thank you very much for watching. I'm out of here. See you again. Oh, I've got another SG coming soon. Gordon Smith GS2 uh, coming up over the weekend and a couple of other things on top of that. But I'll see you then. Bye for now.